All righty, my name is Andy Law. I am the game chap, apparently. Yeah, you are. Um, I'm a designer, producer, cartographer, doer of pretty much everything, wearer of many hats. Um, I've done everything from designing Warhammer Fantasy roleplay to mapping for Critical Role to pretty much doing everything that I can get my little fingers into. Currently, I'm uh, doing lots of live streaming for Rookery Publications, which I imagine there might be a link somewhere out there from someone somewhere. Um, so do take a check at that. And I'm also organizing, I'm preparing for, as he cringes and feels all unsure about it, an actual play where I'll be playing Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which will be supported, of course, by the ever-so-awesome World Anvil. Um, we are building a gigantic database, slowly but surely in the background for that, which will be supporting all of our actual play. And we're also uh, building right now a big map for Warhammer, which I'm streaming every single week as we add extra bits to it. And uh, that's also going to have complete support on World Anvil. It'll be a, uh, a city with a location of about, I don't know, about 100 and 150 locations, uh, at least 200 NPCs or so. We've got a bunch of people working on that already, and it's super cool. So, yeah, game chat. Go, chap. I'm so excited to see the World Anvil come alive. I already so Andy looked at World Anvil and was like, "Yep, I get this. This is amazing." And then just went and put all of the amazingness that is Warhammer. I should probably have said that better, but put all the amazingness that is Warhammer fantasy into it, just like all at once. It was. <laughs> I've never seen anyone move that fast on World Anvil. And some of you guys give him a run for his money, but holy crap, Andy, did you just like do the thing on World Anvil? Puke hammer. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome <laughs> don't say it i'm sure it's a hashtag uh cat cat would know cat it knows all things about hashtags and all things about writing cat introduce yourself properly because i apparently do not have face words today uh me neither uh cat french aka cat bradbury aka mara dane i write fiction so i have a lot of names uh uh I'm an author of uh, six published novels, one of which was an Amazon bestseller, and uh, in uh, steampunk fantasy, gaslight fantasy, paranormal romance, et cetera. Um, I am also uh, AKA Dungeon Mom on Instagram, where I dole out uh, life and D&D advice to younglings, and uh, <laughs> also the content nerd at World Anvil. So wear a lot of hats. Um, because I have a big old head and I need a lot of hats for them, of course. And so. all of mm -hmm. them are fabulous. Uh, you know me, I don't have to introduce myself. Ha, huh, there are some perks to being the host. Um, <laughs> a few. Uh, today, we are talking about a very naughty topic. What? Naughty? Naughty. In case you're keeping up. Which is hard world building versus soft world building. Now, this is a very interesting question that has been popping up recently and we thought ha huh, maybe we should do a stream about that so i have a writer and a game designer and me i do a bit of both to come and talk to you about these things and uh discuss pros cons examples what the hell are we even talking about here and i think i think a good place to start is literally what is hard world building and what is soft world building like what are the two camps we are in fact discussing today <clears throat> are you going to go for uh the description or shall i dive in with a really rubbish one <laughs> well i mean i can start I'll, I'll tell you what i'll start because everybody seems a little bit cagey and i have a cat here for moral support um so basically uh this is an interesting space it's kind of akin to plotting versus pantsing uh but in terms of world building so what that means in case you're not a writer is are you doing all of the world building before you do the writing now that doesn't necessarily mean top down or bottom up it's not about where you start it's about how you approach the world building versus the thing you are world building for and so soft world building is the opposite of that right it's you start with the thing and a kind of basic like a genre or a character that maybe fits in a genre and as you go with your campaign or as you go with your novel the world building just kind of like coalesces around what you are making so really that's what we're talking when we're talking soft world building versus hard world building a lot of it is about approach but the approach necessarily affects how your world building works like how rigorous is it how how much does it 
stick together? How much can you solve the plot with your world building? All of that we're going to talk about more. But in terms of definition, do you guys have anything to add? I, I think another way to maybe possibly think about it is methodical world building versus organic world building. Mm. Like, do you have a process? Do you have like a checklist? Do you have like, uh, you know, boxes to fill out? Is is there a blueprint versus, oh, I need this thing. So we're going to build off in this direction. So um, I think organic versus methodical is another maybe way to think about it too. I like that. So I'll take a slightly different route since uh, it's always nice to have different angles, isn't it? Um, it? So on the role play side, you could view it as the difference between grabbing your core book or your set adventure and then opening it up and doing what all GMs do, throwing it out the window and actually making it your own. Um, it's something that we all do as we GM, assuming that you're a role player. You take somebody else's world, you look at it and go, that's really cool. Oh, except for that bit. And oh, I'm not so sure about this bit either. Um, and you make it your own. Some people like to pre-prepare making it their own and rewrite those bits themselves and very meticulously, perhaps in a spreadsheet, if you really ain't like, I don't know, somebody else perhaps, um, and figure out exactly how the world should work for yourself. Or alternatively, you just sit down at your table and you go. And you see how it unfolds as you play. Because as we all know, once you sit down at a table, all the best plots generally come from the players anyway. They interact with the storylines that you present. And suddenly you've got something new and exciting that you had never considered. So suddenly your world has got something new that's been added to it. And that's more soft side, the malleable, needable. We can dough this into hopefully a new piece of bread, which might turn into something hard later. I love that. I love that. And that's really interesting that you said that, because I would say if you if you take somebody else's setting, like a published setting, and then you meticulously make all the changes beforehand, mm -hmm. that brings me back to hard world building again. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Whereas the changes Absolutely. that you make on the fly, because, you know, no plan makes contact with the enemy or your players. Um, <laughs> that's the soft world building side. That's the, uh, but I needed this same thing. So therefore I have it. I didn't world build teapots, but now I need a teapot. So it's there. Um, you know, that's the soft world building side. And I think, I think where we're going to land, and you can quote me on this in, you know, 50 minutes or something. I think where we're going to land is you need a bit of both. Hmm. But yeah, let's I explore think, this in more detail. I think that's exactly how I do everything that I do. Um, I tend to work from published material, possibly because I've written it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of making counts, it up on the fly counts. as well. Still <laughs> counts though, doesn't it? Um, like, for example, I'm going to be running... Um, Warhammer's most famous campaign, The Enemy Within. I'm going to be actual playing that. Uh, but I have purposefully not pinned it all down too much because I'm very keen to see how the players interact with what's presented there and then allowing it to organically go in its own direction. Um, I have an enormous amount of hard world building behind that. And I do mean a stupendous, far too much amount of it because I am who I am. Uh, but all of that is there to support what the players are doing at the table. And all of that is there to be overwritten, changed, modified, or developed as whatever will make the best story. Because um, ultimately, that's what it's all about, at least on the role play side of things. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, uh, we've talked about the basic difference. We're going to start with hard world building, because I think that's something that, that is sort of more, I mean, it's Sounds more tangible. hard. <laughs> I was going to say it's more tangible. I was going the other direction with a pun, but yes. Uh, let's start with some examples. Examples of hard world building. Kat, you came up with a great one. I did? Oh, when we were chatting. Oh, right, the right, The granddaddy right. of Logan, world building. Yeah. Tolkien, like, yes, because, like, I mean, he needed every, like, language and maps and culture and entire history and mythology. And, like, before, before a, a word of prose, everything was... You know, he created a world and then built stories in it, mm. I think, is probably the best way to describe his process. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for me, The Expanse counts in a way because, or at least the novels for The Expanse, because it was a role playing game, it was like a home game that they tried to turn into a role playing, uh, like a published role playing game. It never got published. And then it became a series of novels. But of course, the world was already written for the role-playing game. So by the time they got to the novels, everything was was created. They knew how the world worked. So for me, that's kind of more like the hard world-building space, but maybe they use the soft 
world building mechanism of the role play game to get them where they needed to be. I think it's like maybe an interesting hybrid example. Okay, since um, I appear to be inhabiting the role play space, um, I'm going to go really on topic and use World Anvil as an example. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, that's what we should be doing, really. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm mapping every single week, week a place called Caligan, which is in uh, the Empire, one of the core settings for Warhammer. And as we do that, we're discussing it out uh, live, and I'm drawing it. And we're creating it all together, whoever happens to turn up on the stream. And we put new ideas in, we build it all up, and then that's all going to get lifted up, ported, and dropped down into World Anvil. Each special location, each district, all of them hard-baked into place. And to further support that, they're all going to have adventure hooks added to them as well. And I don't just mean your classic, oh, here's Bob the Builder, who you happen to meet in Bob the Builder land, um, and he sends you over there to go do Bob the Building business. Um, that, I mean, that's what most adventure hooks sort of circulate around. Apparently, it's all Bob the Builder, and he can fix it. Um but what we're doing is we're hard linking all of the various locations together. And by that, I mean, you might arrive at a location where there's lots of halflings and they're having some trouble with somebody that's over on the other side of town. You go over to the other side of town, you arrive at location 12, and that's got another two adventure hooks in it, one of which at least goes off somewhere else, ensuring that all the material links together with hard constructed scaffolding as a location. So it's not just a host of separate 120, 150 locations that you can drop into and go, how do I use this as an adventure? It's something that once you arrive, turns into a complete sandbox. It feels completely free. It feels like it's uh, entirely up to the GM's whim and players going from X to Y and wherever they fancy going. But in truth, there's a very strong support network lying behind it to ensure that any GM that uses the material has, well, a hard background that they can use immediately and potentially never have to actually do the whole wing it thing because they can just go from place to place to place to place using all the primary plot lines that are there. And if you've got 150 locations, your average hook taking a uh, half a session to a session, that means you've got yourself like 300 sessions just with one single world anvil fang. <laughs> that is that is really impressive, can I just? Well, I've got to keep on topic, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> I did not pay him to say this. Okay, so anybody's wondering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, yeah. Are there examples of hard world building? Are there examples of it? Um, yeah. Beyond just... Um, I'll drop in with just every single role-playing book you buy is a piece of hard world building. Yeah. Every single one. Um, it provides all the scaffolding, all the framework um, that you require to then go create your own material. Um, and it's uh, in terms of what it presents, it's a host of very fixed rules, a world that is established, a set of magic that's established, a set of perhaps divine rules that are established, everything that the player can look at and then immediately pick apart uh, from the player side and go, this is how it works and understand. And from the GM side, exactly the same. Um, so I would, I would open with every RPG book you buy is a piece of hard world building. Okay, are you ready for a spicy take? Oh, hey, go spicy. for it. It's spicy. So I, like spicy takes. I would say until you give the book to your players or until they have experienced it as a GM, that's not hard world building. Because you still okay. have the ability to change things and introduce things and that kind of thing. I'm not disagreeing with you. I actually completely agree with you. And this is where it gets interesting for me because uh, Kat and I were talking about this earlier. Books have predetermined choices. The characters make choices. Once the character learns something, unless it's an unreliable narrator, that thing is canon and exists. Once the characters do something, that thing is canon. When the reader reads the book. Not when the writer is writing the book, we can change things. We do a lot. My God, the drafts, they haunt me. But by the time the reader reads the book, by the time the thing is consumed, it's set. And so the question of hard world building versus soft world building is a question for the author. Are you JK Rowling and you plot everything out in advance or Brandon Sanderson? Or are you George R. R. Martin and you prefer to garden your plot and take 25 years to write your book? Um, <laughs> no judgment. But for GMs, it's a really different thing than for RPG writers. And that is fascinating. To me. I did not mean to go down this, this rabbit hole, but that is fascinating to me. 
it's completely true. I mean, RPG writing is unlike any other type of writing. Every other type of writing, you're generally telling a story, loosely yeah. speaking, um, when it comes to your fiction writing. Where as an RPG writer, you're not telling a story, even if you're writing an adventure that's telling a story. What you're doing is providing a set of tools so that someone else can tell a story. Um, it's a completely different framework, and it may look similar, and many RPG writers may not realize what they're doing, meaning that they get very caught up in trying to tell a story themselves and often railroading a particular plot because they can't think of how to resolve it otherwise, forgetting that they're actually trying to inspire you, the GM, assuming you are a GM, um, and they should be providing you with all the tools to come up with your own answers rather than supplying the answers um, and providing the players with routes to finding their own answers as well emergent gameplay rather than fixed gameplay so broadly yes i agree yeah and speaking of like what is canon and what is not canon that's another place where in fiction you've got that hard world building example where you where you're working with licensed properties and things like that a lot of writers mm -hmm. do there there's a there is a bible for that particular franchise yep. and that is where all the hard world building is and you have to follow it um kindle worlds did something similar with that um, a while back where uh, different writers could jump into a particular franchise, but they had to follow the world Bible that was already established in order to be able to take uh, take part in that IP. So um, it's it's very much the case with RPGs, but it, there's there are a lot of use cases in fiction uh, as well where that's where you're starting from that firm foundation, but then you have a little wiggle room to. Yeah, I, I agree completely. When, when you're working in somebody else's IP, um, you are already working within a frame. Yeah. Um, you've already got a host of pillars already in place that you're hopefully standing on and are supporting you to build something cooler and higher than what was originally put in place. However, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes the uh, IP you're working towards is so very tightly controlled that it's not so much that you're standing on the pillars, they're just the walls are all around you. And all you can do is just add a couple of bricks at the bottom and hope that somebody doesn't come along and smash them with a hammer. Um, but yeah, very much, very much um, uh, for an RPG side of things, um, world Bibles of that ilk are relatively common, or at least they should be. Um, often you'll find for established IPs that the world Bible is nothing more than all the books they've already produced. And if you happen not to have bought those as a writer, if you come in, they'll just go, well, you better know your stuff because if you don't, <laughs> if you don't, you're in trouble. And you're like, ah, right. Um, okay. I'll be back soon. Um, so where, this was yeah. exactly my experience when I did the Dark Crystal RPG. I, I knew the movie, I knew the Netflix show, I hadn't read all the books, and I hadn't read all the comics. And my god, there's a lot of comics. Um, so step number one was literally just, there is no world bible, sit down and consume all the media, mm -hmm. and then come up with your own set of rules. Yeah. That was it. So that is, funnily enough, that's a very soft world building style world, which we'll talk about later, um, where there is a lot of room for wiggling. Um, but in a lot of worlds, it feels like a hard world, but there's not enough written down when they give it to you. Like there are hard world rules, but nobody has put them into words for you as the writer to follow or for you as the game master to follow, which I think is a big mistake. Like if there are hard precepts in mm -hmm. your worlds, you need yep. to tell the GMs about them. Yep. Yeah. Um, you've just described writing for Warhammer. Um, oh. There is there is no big uh, overarching world Bible for Warhammer. What there is is whatever they most recently produced. And that yeah. often contradicts what they produced a few years earlier and a few years before that and a few years before that. And that's a purposeful design element. Uh, for example, when I was working on uh, material for Black Library, which is the, uh, the, the imprint for novels and background books for Games Workshop, um, yeah. the publishing imprint, uh, when I came in, I was very much a I need to have everything correct type of guy. They were quite the opposite. They wanted to have the freedom to tell the stories that they wanted to tell without the constraints of any of the previously published material controlling them um, so that their uh, storytellers could tell whatever story they thought was best for the setting. Um, there was certain core rules, but again, they weren't hard coded in a nice set of 10 commandments that you should look at and say, you must have all these things. But they always hired people who already knew the tone and the feel anyway. Um, so yeah, it was a, it, it's an interesting experience having that complete freedom while simultaneously having fan expectation providing more of a framework than the actual company that's um, uh, hired you. Yeah. 
when the world Bible is an oral tradition. Yes. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> so that brings me really nicely onto soft world building. <laughs> Let's talk about examples of soft world building. So that's like world building as you create the thing. Um, and I'm going to give, uh, funny enough, I didn't give this example in the hard world building, but uh, I had the privilege to follow both the NK Jameson masterclass on writing on masterclass and the Neil Gaiman masterclass on writing. And they are so opposite on world building. NK Jameson is like, build all the things. The things must be built. How can you know? unless you build them. You must build mm -hmm. them first. You will make the world. The world will provide you with joy and solutions and stories. It is wonderful. Neil Gaiman's like, setting's just some smudges in the background. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's pretty but, much exactly but, what he's like. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's a few smudges. It's fine. Don't worry about it. If you need something, just make it. So the, mm. for me, that's the epitome of soft world building. He's like, and then the setting just kind of happens around the characters, right? Yeah. Now he's Neil Gaiman, right? He's not, I'm not saying he's a bad writer. He's, he's like spectacular, but it's a completely opposite approach. And that is my example, soft world building. I'd love to hear yours. I'll jump in then. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm going for the role play angle, obviously, although I've got a few things Excuse I could me. say on the other side too. Um, so on the role play side, it's very much sitting down at the table and playing and not feeling constrained necessarily by whatever world it is that you're sitting in. Um, but I don't necessarily mean the established rules of the world, how magic works. There are always handy pillars with which to put your soft building on top of. Um, I'm talking more the, we've got an established plot, the players arrive at it, they see it and go, yeah, I don't think so. I've got this princess to save. Seriously, you're saving a princess? That's just like so 1980. But you know, that's where the players are going. <sighs> uh, let's let's try and subvert their expectations and change this a little bit if we can. Um, and then going where the players go within that world. Sandbox, emergent gameplay, rather than fixed story that may come from an established campaign. So that's one clean example from role-playing games. Um, I'm also to a degree going to mirror what uh, Janet said there. Um, I remember sitting on a panel once with, oh my goodness, I can't remember his name. Oh, I hate it when that happens. When you've got oh. someone in your mind, um, he was he wrote the ice schooner. He's an author. It doesn't matter. He was an author, and he was um, uh, pretty good friends with J.R.R. Tolkien back in the day. Michael Moorcock. Uh, no, it wasn't Michael Moorcock's one. It's a different one. Um, he wrote the sadly, ice yes, he did. It was a. Uh, I might be conflating the names. Doesn't matter. It's not Michael Moorcock because that's okay. He I just I'm doing Google Foo. <laughs> He's a very soft writer, though Michael Moorcock. Just uh, yes. as an aside, and I'm a big fan of his. Um, but uh, he was very much of the, you have to build absolutely everything. Um, and he had detailed all of his worlds and he dropped his character in it. He had an, over, uh, an overarching idea of where the story would go. And he just let it go within the framework of the world. And the story sort of told itself because everything was already built. Very much as Janet was saying. Where I had just that week been speaking to one of Black Library's authors, and he was quite literally the opposite. He was like, every single detail in the game world is an impediment to me telling the story as I want to tell it. I want to be able to go wherever I want, to take my characters wherever they go, without having to fear that there's a town over there already that there's a mm. forest over in front of me that I've got to get through first. I only want a forest there if I bloody put it there because I need it for my bloody story that I've decided as I'm working my way through this chapter. Having said that, though, he planned all of his chapters very carefully as in what each one of them would do, mm. but, he, but he never at any point allowed the plan to dictate what was definitely happening in his story. He let it go. Um, so, yeah, uh, a bit a mixture of the soft and the hard there. Um, but ultimately, as far as he was concerned, 100% soft mm. because he, he did not like to be constrained. And that made for quite an interesting argument at the table in our convention. I can it was, imagine. It was friendly. <laughs> okay. No beards were pulled. I'm assuming no beards were pulled, Andy. No. No, he, I'm trying to remember if he had a beard. <laughs> I didn't pull. Really... We disagreed, shall we say? <laughs> um, oh, in fact, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no. Go ahead, Andy. Oh, I'm just going to drop one small bit. Um, on the soft world building front, I'll give a very clean example, actually, because I've got a pretty good one. Um, I was hired on uh, to help Will Wheaton's 
a tabletop role playing game show. Um, it was called Titans Grave that was attached to his board gaming show that he did for Geek and Sundry back in the day. And uh, I got roped in about two weeks, I think, before they were due to go live. And at that point, they had no world. They had, no. they had, no, they had nothing other than the story they were attempting to tell. That was it. And oh, that's all soft manner, world building. Oh my and God. all manner of awesome ideas that were nothing more than ideas, many of which they'd thrown at artists and said, hey, artists, draw this cool thing. Hey, artists, draw that cool thing. It was very much an early version of the concepts coming before the story and pinning everything down so that the concepts can inspire the writers. So um, when I came in, I, I was sitting there speaking to Will, and he was like, hey, Andy, I see your work. You're great. This, that, and the other. And I was like, hey, Will, wow, you're super excited. This is great. Um, and we had a lovely chat about his world. And as it slowly unfolded, I had a dawning horror that I was about to map something that didn't exist in anybody's mind. Um, uh, so I, I, I sort of went back and went, OK, so so what what sort of leeway do I have here? What can I do? And he paused for a second and went, go wild. <laughs> Quite literally the uh, definition of soft world building. So um, the when I sat down in front of my computer screen that was blank, getting ready to try and work out how to make a poster map a whole, out of effectively a tabula rasa, a blank slate, um, my first thought was this needs to be an island because an island has edges. And this needs some form of definition. If it just goes off the page, it's going to go even madder. So uh, that's how I started by drawing a continent and then built up from that point onwards. And boundaries. Because obviously I was, boundaries. Yeah, boundaries. Um, but because we had that, that was really useful. I could do things like start adding locations, adding my daughter's name. Oh, there's Lorelei's rest over there. Excellent. Um, and all those things got um, popped on. But none of it was detailed. None of the locations were detailed. They were just given super cool fancy names. And a couple mm. of them were given super cool fancy picture -y type things um, so that a writer could then come along later and go well this looks interesting I wonder what that is I will now decide quite literally the definition of soft world building yeah amazing that is such a good example and thank you for sharing that process that is amazing <laughs> Kat over on the writing side examples of soft world building writers who do soft world building for their books well we did talk about uh, Sir Terry Pratchett that like mm -hmm. that was very much a, a world that was built as as needed ad hoc. Um, I thought about after we had our discussion that like, and this is a controversial figure recently in the world of world building, Stephen King. Um, right. <laughs> who did that tweet that was like, who needs world like, building? And I was like, dude, I need world building. building. Shut up. A single tweet. And, but like, yeah, the Dark Tower stuff and even like the greater like Castle Rock stuff has all very clearly been just sort of you know, plot gardening and, and building out the world as needed. I don't think he had some great vision for the Dark Tower world uh, prior to, I, th I think, yeah. Um, so so maybe, maybe the tweet storm was a little understandable, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so clearly a soft world builder is, is Uncle Stevie, so. Um, I think, or also a very good example of a pantser. Like if you read his book, his memoir on writing, um, which is a wonderful memoir for me personally, as a writer, very unhelpful writing book for me personally. I understand some people really loved it. That's awesome. I'm a plotter. I live in the plot camp. It's where I go to sleep. So um, yeah, pantsing is not for me. And I think that a lot of soft world builders tend to be pantsers as well. Like they, just, they don't want anything between them and the story. They just want the story and then everything is created to serve the story well and you had mentioned neil gaiman earlier and like one of his famous quotes is like on the first draft you just get it all out and then on the second draft you make it all seem like it was intentional like you, like you yeah. pre planned <laughs> so that 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 right there speaks to a soft world builder like mm. yeah for sure yeah absolutely I've, I've so yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I've got a similar example. Um, we've been building a large campaign at Rookery Publications, uh, which is our little tiny little indie imprint thing that's doing games and board games and roleplay games and such like. And we're doing a nice big epic campaign. Um, and uh, one of my partners, Andy Leesk, and I were uh, plotting that whole thing out. And let's say plotting it loosely, but most definitely plotting it. 
And then we were speaking to uh, another writer friend of ours, a chap called Nathan Long. He works over at NXL Studios, Microsoft, one of Microsoft Studios. He's the head writer over there. And we were discussing the plot. And he looked at it and went, what plot? Where's all the connecting tape? Where's this? Where's that? And we're like, I'll be fine. We'll write that in a place as we go. And it'll be all right. <laughs> um, and that was a really useful uh, insight, both into how different people approach a similar style of project, where he will sit there and post-it note every single beat that will be working through his um, story, where we were working towards an overall, uh, let's say, overarching plot, and then filling it in as we went. So pantsing it, so to speak. Um, two very different uh, styles for the same project. It's good fun, though. Yeah, absolutely. And again, at the end of the day, just to be clear, whatever works for you is fine. I think we all here believe that. Everybody has their own process. I am plot or die. And when I mean die, it means whenever I try and plat pants, bad things happen. But I GM and in a different way than I write, for example. Like, it's much more free. And it's whatever works for you is fine. Like, we're not condemning anything here mm -hmm. it's just about you know discussing what your options are and what to look out for which actually takes me to the next space pros and cons of hard world building this is the do it all in advance get it all set up make some choices about your world in advance pros and cons oh, what give helps a bit. and what hinders no, go. go ahead oh, i was gonna say um this is a this is a I was going to say that serial fiction, any kind of serial fiction demands a certain level of soft world building because mm. you cannot possibly know what is going to happen between now and then. Um, comic books, television writing, anything like that, Kindle Bellas, all of that kind of thing. Um, but um, by the same token, you also need a certain amount of hard world building or else it's very, very difficult to keep the ship pointed in a particular direction. Like, I think the the cons of soft world building for serial fiction is that it makes it very, very easy to introduce continuity errors. If you don't set a certain number of stakes in the ground from the jump, then you are absolutely going to end up with like massive continuity errors in yeah. any kind of serial fiction. Amen to that. Um, so uh, contrary to what I was just suggesting with my previous comment, um, when I write, I plan meticulously down to individual paragraph word count. It's the sort of chap that I am. Particularly, um, my writing is not fiction writing. It's often writing source books or it's writing adventures, which are a very different uh, beast, particularly if you're working to a particular page count. And you know you've only got a limited number of pages to tell a particular story or to describe a particular location. So you've got to make sure that it all works. So I plan that out ahead of time. Now, if you plan out a book beforehand, it's really easy to fill in 50, 300, 450, 30, 150, 70 words into each one of those individual paragraphs. And if you've got it all planned out, it makes it super simple to write the book in comparison to just going where you're never quite sure where the end is. You're never quite sure where any of the individual paragraphs, stroke locations, stroke chapters are going to end. And through working in that way, you might end up with something that's perhaps more dynamic, perhaps more vibrant, because you've allowed yourself more space to explore an idea. But at the same point, sometimes a limitation really does spark the creativity because if you've only got 100 words to say something that you're damned if you can fit into 300 suddenly you have to start thinking in a different way how can i get that in without having to say excuse me mr editor I was often myself can i just have more space please <laughs> um uh and another big big benefit um on the planning side on the harder side of uh doing your writing um, is that it's not going to sprawl into infinity. Yeah. Um, it's it's a limited project and a project that you're much more likely to finish. Where if you've got yourself an open-ended story that you're not quite sure where it's going, not only can it potentially just keep on going, you might end up plotting yourself into a corner that you don't really see how you can get out of um, because you weren't really planning for it to go anywhere. And when it landed somewhere that was super cool, you suddenly go, oh, oh dear. I sense Deus Ex Machina coming in my near future because something has gone very wrong, which can involve heavy rewrites at a later date, significant editing at a later date. So there is some significant downsides potentially there if you're not keeping your eye open as to where you're going. But yeah, I do like a plan. I write to plans. 
<laughs> I think for me, um, pros and cons. So hard world building again, like I am somebody who likes to plan in general. Um, but as Andy says, if you if you're too rigorous, it's easy to kill the spark. It's easy to make it not fun anymore. And I think that's mm -hmm. something that's really important. You need to leave yourself enough wiggle room that you have space for opportunities and ideas. And that's something that is dangerous with hard world building, because when you're really pinning everything to the page, you're saying this is like this and this is like this and this is like this. The more you do that, the less space you have to maneuver. The less space you have to maneuver, the less creative it can feel sometimes when your characters are going into a new space. And that's either MCs or PCs. So written characters for authors or player characters for um for campaigns where they go in there and suddenly you're like oh actually wouldn't it have been great if i had introduced this uh circus element to the city because one of my characters is a circus person and that would have been really interesting but i can't do that now because i've already put everything in place and i i cry for those lost opportunities because as a storyteller you know that's that's where you can bring out character. That's where you can bring out coincidences and background. And um, so I think that's really the pros and cons of hard world building. It gives you such a great structure. It can make your world feel so uh, authentic because you've thought through things as long as you're not expert dumping, right? Because that's the danger as well. Um, but yeah, sometimes it gets you stuck, just so stuck. I'll give an example of that because um, I'm currently planning out uh, what is going to be about a year's worth of actual play campaign. Um, my players are gathering in the next door room right now. Um, we're doing the very last of our not tape sessions tonight. And then after that, we're in front of a camera and it's going to be ridiculous. Um, and that's always going to be fun. But uh, I have very, very strictly planned exactly how many sessions it's going to take to run this campaign, what each session is going to be called, what it's going to cover. And that sounds deeply, deeply unspontaneous. Um, it sounds like the whole thing is going to be one gigantic railroad track. And that is something that I'm hard coding in while simultaneously uh, allowing enough space so that won't be the case because spontaneity at the table is what makes role playing games so much fun. It's yeah. the unique moments that are created at your table, those memorable moments, the things that you do that makes everybody go, What? Um, or makes everybody go, Wow, or, ah! or, or anything similar. And you can script some of those, but the scripted ones are often significantly less impactful than the ones that the players themselves bring to the table. Um, so allowing all of that space while simultaneously scripting it really tightly has been a hard, soft nightmare. <laughs> we'll see how well it works in a few weeks' time, I suppose. <laughs> Amazing. Anything to add on that, Kat? Uh, yeah, I think there's there's also that danger of losing that spark in, in fiction as well, because like yeah. um, you're coming at this from a slightly different angle, but there, mm -hmm. when, you, when you don't leave yourself the drafting process can be very um, can be kind of a slog, and if you have already come up with all of the cool surprises during your um, plotting and during your your world building and, and pre writing stage, then you don't have the that that dopamine rush of coming up with like oh that's the perfect thing that I didn't think about before this moment. And if you've already had that oh my gosh, dopamine rush of I came up with this very cool twist or this very cool angle or this very cool concept or premise while you were doing the pre-writing, then it's not there to fuel you through the draft. So you you, you just run out of steam. So yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's what I was saying before about that, like that creative juice, like it just, it gets dull. It's like butterflies pinned to the page. Like it, they lose their luster as a writer if they don't wiggle a bit, you know. That sounded oddly maudlin, so I'm going to move on. Pros and cons of soft world building, my loves. <laughs> what are we thinking? Soft world building. So as a reminder for people new to this topic, that's the world building that kind of happens as you go along. The stuff that like clings to the story to make it work as the story goes through. But you haven't necessarily built anything out in advance. <clears throat> I would sort of covered that in my previous answer to a degree. So I'll be very brief and say, loosely, the pros are freedom. You have a lot of freedom um, and spontaneity. 
add unexpected twists and turns that add that spark of vitality to the game that might not have been there or the fiction that you're writing that might not have been there if you were working to a very tight plan um, within a very restricted world. Uh, you often find, I often find at least when I'm writing, suddenly just something, a bolt from the blue, as they like to say, just comes out and you're like, oh, I could have this happen. I could do this instead. I could do it this. Oh, wow. Excellent. Um, but if that contradicts your plan, suddenly you're left with a quandary. Do I go in this new direction? Do I not go in this new direction? So not worrying too much about that and relying on the soft side brings a relatively strong pro. Um, but the downside is exactly the one I mentioned earlier is one deep con, and that is it can go off into weird cul-de-sacs that you never really needed to go into. And sometimes it can go meandering down a stream that never reaches the sea. Um, and that's something you have to be careful of. Yeah, absolutely. What are your thoughts, Kat? Pros and cons of soft world building? Um, the pros are you don't build anything you don't need. Um, there's there's nothing wasted when you're doing soft world That's building, you do, and you don't spend a, a ton of time building, a, you know, a village or a, a culture or a concept or something like that that you're never going to end up using, and that feels very wasteful. I mean, writers we, we recycle things. I pull things from drafts that didn't make it into that into, into new projects and things like that. But it's still, you know, most of us are not privileged to be able to have writing be our full time job, and so the amount of time that you spend is very precious. And so not wasting it with soft world building is, is a big pro to, to me. Uh, the con is just kind of what I said before, is there is so much opportunity for continuity errors. When you don't build your world Bible in advance, when, when your world Bible, Bible just sort of emerges from, from your draft and from your prose or from like little notes that you do in advance, it's so easy to forget like little things, but readers will catch every last one of them. And you'll be like, they'll be like you said that this was this, but over here it's that, so which is it? lying liar who lies for a living so yeah. <laughs> perfect example of that so imagine me imagine me 13 it was a mess you're welcome guys for that <laughs> little brain image so me at 13 biggest nerd that you ever graced the universe uh found terry pratchett oh my god mm -hmm. how much did i love him and then i read every single one of his books in order of course i did i was 13 what the hell else was i gonna do so mm -hmm. uh having read all of his books in order and again like my mind was free of things like mortgages and children and having to run a business and stuff so i could really concentrate on these novels um i started to be like huh he said this here but it's different in this book and mm -hmm. then in this book it's different again and then here it's not the same and some of this stuff is stuff that uh as Again, E. Chris Indy said it could be unreliable narrator, but some of this stuff was like stuff in the footnotes that's like from the omniscient third person narrator. <laughs> and that's the downside of having an omniscient narrator, kids, is that they're supposed to be omniscient and then sometimes things are different. Anyway, it's uh, it's not a problem. I still love the books. I still love them to this day. But it's a perfect example of, of those kind of lack of continuity errors and the bigger the scope of your series, the Discworld is huge the worse it gets but i'm gonna give my answer not from me but from professor trent Hergenrader, who is a professor of world building i am on this stream a couple of years ago and he told me the biggest mistake he sees in world building in his own students in in out in the world is what he refers to as mary sue world building so the world building is really only as big as the main character and that's that's a real problem that's what turns players into murder hobos that's what makes it is because the, the players there's no consequences they're the main yeah. characters in the truest sense it's what makes main characters seem really whine, whiny and make the plot seem like it's serving them because everything around them is built for them and there's yeah. nobody going on Nobody is doing anything else in the world. It's just everything's about the main character. And that's really sad because there are so many beautiful world concepts that fall flat. I see this in TV series a lot as well. It makes me very sad um, because the world isn't bigger than the main characters, which means that it never feels authentic. It never has that. I don't like to say real because, you know, we're talking about dragons. Here. Uh, it never feels authentic and it never has that kind of like sparkle of something deeper what's in the cupboard what's around the corner what's over the hill i'm never curious because it's really only as big as the main characters and that for me is the big con for software building you never see anything more 
and that makes me sad. And it's very sad because when whenever television shows or things like that do do like a bottle episode or or take the narrative away to some side characters, there is a television show that did this recently and caught a lot of heck about it. Um, like it 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 helps build the world and make it feel more yeah like and everyone's like just filler episode. Why did you throw in that? Like oh. it's not filler. It's not. It's, it's important. Very <laughs> with you completely. Um, <laughs> yeah, completely. I was going to say something that has now fled my mind because I'm now thinking about that. In fact, no, it actually ties in. Um, I'm going to segue into that one nicely. It's something that happens a lot in computer games, um, mm. an awful lot, particularly in computer role-playing games, um, where you're given a character whose manifest destiny is to do everything, fetch everything, meet everyone, be the guild leader of every guild, to be the, gra the grand high wizard of every grand high wizard, to effectively do everything in the world. And those games that spend that little bit of extra time to have their NPCs do other things. And when you come back to them, they perhaps had a little bit of development or moved into a new place or things have moved on from when the last time you saw them standing beside the workshop doing absolutely nothing all day. Um, it's, it's something that computer games often do very, very badly. Um, and they think they've done it exceptionally well. There's some games that are really bad for it. Um, and once you break that immersion, you suddenly feel like you're playing a computer game. Um, mm. And it's and and they feel like they've built this enormous world with an enormous amount of detail. But all of that detail is tied in purely for one reason, and that's for your PC to encounter it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, mm, there, there's there advantages any... there. It is a lot faster creating that way. Are there any examples that you'd like to share? Mm. I mean, I don't like criticizing other people's work directly. <laughs> no, I know. It's just, it's helpful for people to 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 see them and be like, oh, okay, that. Right. So but... I'm going to go for one that's quite popular um, and uh, I think demonstrates um, a lack of overarching thought and that's both Fallout and the Elder Scroll games. Mm. Um, now, these games are lauded often for a variety of reasons, but I think very few people laud them for their great plots. They tend to have occasionally one or two plot lines that are really fun, but they're always there waiting for you to encounter them, regardless of what time you get to them. Um, the plots never change. You can go at them in any direction you want. The whole thing is very, very gamey. And it's designed for that because at its best, what it does really well what Fallout and Skyrim et al. Elder Scrolls do really well is emergent gameplay when you're exploring. That is where the game shines, but it's not what it sells itself as. It sells yeah. itself as a, as a great role-playing game. But if your role-playing game opens, let's take Fallout 4 with, hi, I'm a character who's got a main goal, which is time-limited, and you must do that immediately. You walk out into the wasteland and walk in a different direction, and nothing happens because of that. You've got a narrative problem. And almost all of, the, of uh, Beth, Bethesda's games do that. They give you a, you must go do this. It's really important. Your child will die. No, no, there's something really cool over there. I'm going to go look at that cool thing. Oh, it's a scorpion. Woo. Um, ah, shit. Ah, I'm getting chased. Ah. And, you, and you're running away, jumping up and down like a lunatic. No, oh, now I'm building my own house. That is where the game really shines. Yeah. Uh, it's not the narrative side. So that, that's one example of both to a degree. The soft world building, the world building that the player is creating against their hard world building, which is often, uh, it often lacks the necessary depth to make it feel real. Yeah. I, I think that like there's a similar dynamic in the, the Bioware games, Mass Effect and Dragon Age. But I, I think them. that they it without with by kind of hanging a lampshade on it like mm -hmm. shepherd is shepherd because shepherd you know like uh, of course like the, the the bit that he does he does ads for stores <laughs> in the citadel sort of like they lampshade that he's got main character syndrome or she if you're playing she, with them she is, always okay. femme ship always femme ship. um uh and i've and i haven't played it yet but i know marvel's um Midnight Suns game had there. There's been some criticism that like, why do all these like top tier Marvel superheroes want to be this rand random uh, protagonist's new best friend? Like, have they read the comics? <laughs> <laughs> I have no problems with new friends. Like, why would you want a new best friend if you're exactly. Captain Marvel and, or Iron Man? 
Like, and the comics bend their backs over completely for ridiculous narratives. I have no issue with that at all. I played Midnight Suns. Um, I've not completed it yet. I'm near the end. And yeah, it, that wasn't what took me out of the game. Um, although for you Mass Effect and Dragon Age fans, there is no romance options. So don't think that Spider-Man is going to be your mate, super friend. Um, <laughs> Yeah, sadly okay. i love <laughs> i love where this has gone i am here for it um let's talk because we've gone into into sort of genres and media are there any particular genres that benefit from hard versus soft world building do you feel like sci-fi or fantasy or uh benefit from one or the other I think that urban fantasy, you have to make some tentpole decisions early on for your world building, like that lean more towards hard world building. Like if, is it going to be a secret, secret magic society or does everybody know? Because if everybody knows, then you've got an alternate history and you have to decide mm -hmm. at what point that happened and at what point they diverged and what the implications of that all are. And that leans more towards having a hard world building framework. Yeah. Um, whereas if you're doing more paranormal romance and it's just like, it's a romance, but vampires, then like, you can probably get away with soft world building and, and come up with things that you need, especially, uh, genres that tend to be heavy, heavily serialized, kind of like I was mm. talking about earlier. If you know, you're going to be writing like six to eight books in this series, then like, don't put a hundred stakes in the ground, maybe put 10. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Andy? Genres of genres or premises that really benefit from hard world building or from soft world building? So hmm, I have lots of opinions and I'm trying to decide which one I like most. I'm going to fall down on hard sci-fi kind of needs hard world building. It yeah. needs to all make sense. And if it doesn't make sense and you're trying to pitch it as hard sci-fi, you're going to get torn to shreds. Yeah. Um, that's why so many people who are writing sci-fi tend to go a bit more speculative <laughs> because yeah. then you don't necessarily need to be tied down in quite the same way. Um, so, for example, if you take The Last Jedi um, and then the sudden awareness that they could warp out and go forward, just go hyperspace forward. But no, they're in a chase scene in ships that can go faster than light because because fuel or something. But, but what about the ships that are in the back? They don't have any problems with fuel. Why aren't they? Why is there a chase going on? What's going on here? And, <laughs> and you will get people who will respond like that to your fiction if there are rules being broken within the established game world. And sci-fi tends to have that a bit more than wizzy woo fantasy. Oh, my wizard can do this this week. And next week, he happens to do this. Next week, my vampire can suddenly jump over a building. Why? Because they always could. It could they, um, in comparison to say the Jedi, take for example the very first movie where they go Jedi speed, whoosh, and they run away from the robots and never do it again because because they forget that they can go super fast. Um, <laughs> so it's it's quite important as a creator and as somebody who's monitoring that that if you do establish rules, even if it's soft, that you keep to them or you purposely write rules in that say, oh, there's a lot of fudge around. Yeah. A lot of fudge. You know, these powers, they're a little bit wobbly. They go up and down. And by writing that in, you can just go as free as you want. And you can do that really in any genre, kind of. But the second you decide to go hard and the second you decide to go real world, that immediately mm -hmm. grafts you to a particular type of writing, whether you want it to or not. Yeah. Um, so I suppose I could take the exact opposite view, though. <laughs> as I say, I was debating with myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I mean, these things can be very case by case, absolutely. And there are always exceptions. I think for me, it's also a matter of scale. Like if you're writing people in a camp and, you know, sword and sorcery, adventure by adventure, week by week, then they don't know all the rules. They don't know the whole world. They're just like, they're just taking it as it comes. And then soft world building can, can work better. If you're writing epic, whether that's epic fantasy or epic sci-fi, and there are big systems at play, you need to be a bit more rigorous about it. That's what I think. So if you're suddenly having to deal with things like armies, then there are logistics, and then you need to think about those, and then you need to think about how it works in different places and how different, you know. And again, you don't need to go over the top on this, but you do need to, to think about it in advance, because if suddenly you have an army here, and then two days later, it's all the way on the other side of the country, your readers are going to be asking why. And your players are going to be complaining that it is not realistic. And they only care about that when it's on, on the negative side for them. But 
then they will come and say, well, it's not fair because you said that, like, I, I thought that it's an army and it has to travel all this way, but then they traveled here really fast. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, like, big systems need harder world building, regardless of genre, in my opinion. And jumping off of that, how important theme is mm -hmm. and tone is to your basic premise makes a big difference in how hard your world building needs to be. Because if one of your major themes is systemic injustice, you have Here's to think to of those systems. You have to think through the entire society. If resource scarcity is going to be one of the major drama hooks for your game system, then you have to think, why is that resource scarce? How do, you know, how do people work around that resource scarcity? Things like that. So whatever your theme is, if the through, through line for it requires uh, a lot of big picture thinking, then you have to do that big picture thing, thinking in advance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I Indeed. feel like we could talk about this all day. And God, I would like that. But Andy, I know you have a game to get to. So I, I do. Have, there are people waiting last, in the next room. <laughs> and one last question from me. And then a question from our audience. Yes, so, yes, yes. My last question is, harder soft world building, how do you approach it personally? Like, What's your approach? Okay, also I'll go first. Entirely. I do both. And I do both um, to some significant degree. When I'm writing books, I tend to plan. Um, but depending on who I'm writing for, depends on how much I plan. If it's for my own stuff, I kind of, I'm a little bit more organic. I let it go where it needs to go. If I'm working for somebody else, I'm super strict with myself because I know that my preference is to go a bit organic and to see where it goes. And that is dangerous. You don't need that. Um, if I've got a deadline of, say, two months, I don't need to be you know, two months later going, oh, and I've got this great idea as well. And trying to add that in at a later date. That's not useful. So I, yeah. I in terms of my writing, I'm, I'm relatively rigid. Um, in terms of my game playing, since that's my angle here, um, I tend to prefer having all of the structure in place, all of the scaffolding there, all of the plots good to go. And I presume that's what happens if the players do nothing or just engage with it as it goes and float along. And if they float along, that'll be fine. It's a little bit like a real world. It's a little bit like reading the, the fantasy novel version of their particular actions. But I don't see that as a rigid structure that has to be followed. If they decide to go ally with someone else, if they decide to go hiking over the next hill instead of that hill over there, which is where they were bloody supposed to go, I'm quite cool with that. Um, and I'm very used to ad-libbing as required to ensure that their players have that freedom to go where they wish, how they wish. But in between sessions, I will generally take a, a pause and go, right, they've gone that way. What's over there? How do I best organize that so that I've got myself a new framework and a new structure for them to totally ignore in the next session? <laughs> Amazing. I love that answer so much. Oh, Kat, <laughs> how about you? Hard world building, soft world building or something squishy in the middle? Uh, soft world building, on, world building on draft, hard world building on revision. So That is uh, so, so interesting. <laughs> yeah. the reason that's interesting to me is because i do the opposite <laughs> so i i start out with the big bits of the world and i'm like and this works like this and this works like that and there's these people and these people and here is how the society works and here are some penance of magic that cannot be broken and then i write the novel and I fill in the i fill in the gaps as i go so that's that bit's quite soft but i've got as you were saying i've got the big hard tenets to to fall back on that hold everything together and then as i redraft i'm like oh but that could be cool and then i'll add it and that could be cool and then i'll add it and what i tend to do is the big structures like i was saying before they're all hold hard world building the big concepts how does magic work who are the big players here and then mm. the the boots on the ground stuff the what does magic smell like the you know oh, but how does it feel? Or like, and how does it look when this thing happens? All of that kind of like sensory world building, that all kind of coalesces around the characters, like soup on a ladle, I guess. Because why not? I like soup. Um, so that's what I, I do the opposite from Cat. That is so interesting to me. It is. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, of course, agile world building uh, is how I do my, my GMing. We've talked about this before. You come up with a meta, you come up with some plans, the players do things, you revise your plans. It's kind of a bit like what Andy was saying, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked we've talked about this together before. We have. Um, so, uh, quick question from Churchimus. 
Uh, mm -hmm. They have given their players a huge amount of license to fill in the finer details of species and cultures that they built out. Mm -hmm. Because of this, they've ended up with a vibrant and a live space, but it's moved beyond their vision. Uh, how do you use outside influences to fill in the cracks in your world building? Like, how, okay. how do you work with players, for example, who are filling things in in your world? And how do you manage that? Mm. Okay, so I've got quite a lot I could say in this. This is an entire stream's worth. So I'm just going to I'm just going to go for a couple of small bullet I'll points. Bring here. you back. <laughs> Drop a couple of dots. Um, but loosely talk to them. I mean, I can say a lot here, but talk to them. Be open and be open to their ideas, but be also open to explaining what your theme, your tone, the recurring motifs that you're looking for, what the setting is supposed to be doing, and they will work with you to create something that fits within the model. If you don't talk to them, if you give them complete free reign, they will go places you never expect, and that is sometimes beautiful, but you've got to accept that that's going to go in a completely different direction to what you may initially have intended. And if that is what has occurred, then again, there's an easy fix here. It's all made up. Bring them back in. Talk to them again. It's super easy. You can sit down and say, we've built this cool shit. It's amazing. It's awesome. But it doesn't quite fit with what we've got here, here, and here. What do you think will make that work? And then just sit back. All the answers will come. You'll all feel super awesome because you feel like you've encountered a problem and overcome it. Job done. Amazing. Really good answer. Thank you, Andy. Not a problem. I may have done this a few times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is why I bring in the amazing experts. It's been really nice talking with you guys. You're all amazing. I would like to wish you all a very happy world building, whether you are hard world building, soft world building, agile world building, or, you know, something in between. And uh, for that, you're going to have to grab your hammer and go world build. See you soon, guys. Bye.